So here's another question that I have, and that's, so these, so these institutions are swapping things out and they want Bitcoin or they want whatever they want, right? So let's say, let's just take Bitcoin. So it's the easiest one. Right now, I think you're getting around four and a half to five and a half percent interest on Celsius, somewhere around there. So let's say you make seven or let's just make just one point above. So that's great. So Celsius has to make money. That's fine, right? It goes, the other, other part goes back there. Uh, the institution has to pay a little bit more. So when they take that Bitcoin, they give a bunch of Ethereum up. Bitcoin comes back to these institutions. What exactly are these institutions doing with the Bitcoin that would make them or want them to pay a higher interest rate than anything else? Now, I know institutions cannot, they cannot custody uh, cryptocurrency. There is, there is laws against it. SEC might change that. OCC has talked about it. But here we are. So real quick. Walk us yeah, they, 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 I agree with you. They cannot make money just putting it in custody, right? So, so that, that's not a business, right? You, paying 7 or 8% and then not doing anything with it. So the only reason an institution would borrow it is because they see an opportunity to make money, right? And they don't want to take the directional risk of Bitcoin going up or down, meaning if they use their cash to buy the Bitcoin and Bitcoin drops 10% that day, they lost 10%. But if they gave us cash, borrow Bitcoin, Bitcoin dropped and they returned the Bitcoin, they still got all the cash they gave us. Oh, yeah. I mean, right? that so, makes, yeah, for me, sorry to interrupt, but for me, the cash makes sense, right? The cash goes right. in, Bitcoin goes up 25%. Like, exactly. well, I so only get eight, so I'm good. But if they're going to throw in the Bitcoin, it's kind of weird. Right. So, so again, if they're long, if I agree with you, if they're long Ethereum, meaning they're already holding it, that is a, a different scenario than if they gave us cash. Right. So, so let's talk about both of them uh, separately. So let's talk about the cash first. Uh, and uh, basically, there's really only three activities, main activities that these uh, hedge funds and institutions do. I know, I know everybody keeps it really secretive and it's like hush hush, but I can tell you that there's oh, nothing is. special, nothing special to it. They either do shorting, which is a business that we don't really believe in and we think it's very risky. And shorting uh, means I believe that XRP is going down. Uh, I am going to borrow the XRP from Celsius and give them some kind of collateral. And I'm going to sell it on an exchange, wait a little bit, and then buy it at a lower price. Why? Because I know there's some news coming out, or I know that uh, somebody's about to dump a lot of it, or I know that, for example, the XRP Foundation is needs to sell some coins, and I'm going to sell them ahead of the foundation, right? So just, again, hypothetical. These are all hypothetical of course, examples. Of course, yeah. Right? So, so and I'm not picking on XRP uh, specifically. <laughs> I'm just uh, explaining to people what are the examples, right? So shorting is definitely uh, a good business. There are a few people in the world who are exceptional in it. But uh, on average, it's a very, very risky and very, very bad game. Because if you're wrong, you can get uh, your face ripped off because uh, anyone who shorted Bitcoin at 9,000 and 10,000 and 11,000 got liquidated, right? So, several times over. So, so you may be right, uh, but the market will <laughs> prove you wrong, right? So, so it doesn't matter what you think, right? And what your, th what your direction is. So we, we, in writing, we ask almost every one of our counterparties, are you shorting, right? And if, if their strategies are more than 20% short, meaning whatever we lend them, at least 20% of that is uh, used for shorting, we, we normally would not lend to that institution, right? So because we see that as a very risky strategy for us, right? For the chances of us getting the coins back. So let's talk about the other two strategies. Okay. Well, real quick, the, what, what you said about, the, you know, like we're going to ask them, they're going to short. They're like, we're not going to short. No, and, but you, yeah, but look, yeah. they have to put it in writing. So, so if you are a regulated uh, uh, institution, uh, uh, putting it in writing and, and lying about it is, is actually a pretty big problem with the SEC. It's not a, uh, it's not a little offense, right? So, because you have, to, you have to state in your charter, when you tell the SEC what you do, you have to state in your charter uh, what kind of activities you perform, including the uh, CFTC and so on. So, so if you're not doing shorting, you cannot just start doing shorting the next day, right? So sure. things like that. So, so can somebody lie to us? Of course. But of course. Uh, I think most of these people are, are, you know, if they need the coins for shorting, they'll just go and borrow them from somebody else, not from Celsius. You know? okay. So sorry uh, to interrupt you. Now talk about the other two things before yes. I rudely interrupt you. I'm sorry. 
No, no problem. Mm -hmm. So the other strategy which we actually like is market making. And market making means that uh, orders, buy orders and sell orders mm -hmm. don't come to market at the same time. And meaning there could be a huge buyer coming in, but it came five minutes after a huge seller finished selling, right? So, so who fills that void, right? Who actually fills and is always there to make sure that all the buyers and all the sellers can match their orders, right? And that's what market makers do. And market makers effectively look at statistical volumes, look at directional volumes and things like that, and they know when they can buy and when they can sell. But again, market makers don't want to take directional risk. They don't want to own the Bitcoin in case it drops or in case it even goes up by a lot, right? Because they don't know which direction the coins are going. So they much rather borrow the asset do market making, and uh, uh, what what we charge them for a year, they usually make in a month. So when you say who's going to pay mm. you seven or eight uh, percent, when you look at uh, Jump Trading or Cumberland or all these giant companies that are, that represent twenty, thirty percent each, twenty or thirty percent of all the volume on the New York Stock Exchange or the Nasdaq. Uh, they make all their money market making, right? It's called HFT, high frequency trading. And, and uh, basically they know uh, how to create value just from the fact that buyers and sellers don't show up at the same time. So the same thing exists in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on. And we lend uh, a lot of coins to these market makers, which is a great low risk strategy because again, they're not betting in, in any direction. Right. They're just filling orders and the third, third strategy, which is, again, very simple, every one of us can do it, is arbitrage. What does it mean? Arbitrage, uh, Bitcoin is traded on over 300 exchanges. And at every moment of the day, there is at least a 2 or 3% gap between U.S. exchanges and Asian exchanges and European exchanges. So if you had coins in all the right places, you could buy on Binance, for example, and sell on Coinbase and lock in 1% gain in a second, right? And imagine doing that 10, 20, 30 times a day, right? So, so again, if you're a big enough institution, you can park $10 million worth of coins on a bunch of different exchanges, wait for the price to vary. And in a day, you can make what we, right? We, we charge you 8% a year or 9% a year. If you did one transaction, like I said, once a month, you would be ahead of the game. And they do once a day, not once a month. So, gotcha. so they... The point is, is that those are normal strategies, nothing that I described to you, including lending coins, which is called SEC lending on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. You can go to Google and look up SEC lending. We do exactly the same thing, but instead of lending securities, we lend coins. So none of these practices are practices that are unique or proprietary to crypto. They're, we actually copied all of it from Wall Street. And if you do a search about SEC lending on Wall Street, on your Google search bar, you will not find a single institution in a hundred years that ever went out of business because of SEC lending. They went out of business because of real estate loan and because of, uh, you know, CDOs and, and CLOs and all this other stuff, but not SEC lending. SEC lending is considered one of the safest businesses on Wall Street. And what, what Celsius created was bringing the SEC lending business into crypto and giving the community 80% of that value. Uh, which no one does on Wall Street, Fidelity or Interactive Brokers or even Robinhood does not. They make hundreds of millions of dollars lending your Tesla stock, lending your Facebook, lending your Apple stock. You get none of it. So the big change, the big innovation about Celsius is that we decided to give 80% of that to the community. Gotcha. So I 